approximately 800 to 1,000 Korean women came as a picture brides. And picture brides is simply through exchange of photographs, the groom and brides decided to get married. And it was not you know, unusual at the time. It happened quite frequently back then, early 20th century. And the picture brides became the foundation of Korean American community. Because of their arrival, Korean American community became much more stable and have a family, children, and a community. And sense of community evolved with arrival of these women. And their contribution, their sacrifice, is the foundation of building the larger Korean American community and their contribution should be greatly recognized. Korean American history is rich and complex and reaches as far back as the late 1800s. The signing of the Treaty of Amity, Commerce, and Navigation in 1882 opened the doors for Koreans to come to America. Diplomatic relations between Korea and U.S. started in 1883 when delegation from Korea including Min Young-ik, Hong Young-sik, Seo uh, gwang bong arrived in San Francisco. They were en route to go to Washington, D.C. to sign a treaty. Afterwards, a small number of merchants selling Korean ginseng arrived in San Francisco, but they were having difficulty settling in the area, mainly because by then there were strong anti-Asian, anti-Chinese, and anti-Korean sentiments in the region. But their number were very small. The official beginning of Korean immigration to the United States uh, started in Jan on January 13, 1903, with arrival of 102 Korean immigrants in Honolulu to work as a sugar plantation laborers. By 1905, there were 7,226 of them who had come to the Hawaiian Islands to work on sugar plantations. It was the Hawaiian Sugar Plantation Association who had brought them over to Hawaii. And the reason for that was so that they could help break up any unionizing of the other minorities that were already there, which included the Japanese, the Chinese, and other individuals. The Korean American community lived a very difficult life while they were on the plantations. Um, they worked from dawn to dusk. There was a Luna who overwatched them or overlooked their labor on the field, and they were very, very difficult to work with. If they for a minute stood up, the Luna would whip them or yell at them or tell them, you gotta keep working. Dosan An Chang Ho, famed Korean patriot and leader, emigrated to the United States before official Korean immigration to America began. My mother and father came over here in 1902. They were the first couple to come to the U.S. from Korea. Mother was the second woman to uh, come to the U.S. And they came as students. Dosan and his wife Helen had five children Philip, Filson, Susan, Sora, and Ralph. Dosan lived and worked in the United States for years before being deported in 1926. Helen and her five children, however, continued to live in the United States. They later took up residence in Los Angeles, where the An family house still stands. By 1905, the disillusioned Koreans in Hawaii decided to go to the U.S. mainland. The bustling city of San Francisco served as the port of entry. Meanwhile, Dosan had already begun setting up Korean organizations to help his community. In 1902, Dosan An Chang Ho arrived in San Francisco, saw that the Korean merchants were fighting each other and a lot of conflict. So in 1903, he established a friendship association 
based on that, that further became the Gongni Pyeopwe that got established in 1905, primarily with the residents in Riverside, with the headquarters in San Francisco. And the primary function of that Gongni Pyeopwe was to secure employment for the newly arriving immigrants from Korea. At the time, Riverside was one of the richest cities in the U.S. A thriving citrus industry attracted Koreans and other minorities to the area. Dosan, who had established a Korean Labor Bureau in Riverside in 1905, helped make it easier for his community to get jobs. In that same year, he established the first organized Korean-American settlement. It was known as Pachapa Camp, or Dosan's Republic. We've got to do something. We've got to, we've got to let the Korean people know that uh, they have to have independence. They can't succumb uh, to this annexation. So they raised money here in Pachapa, in the Riverside campus, and in San Francisco, sent our father back to Korea. And uh, our father back went back from 1907, uh, starting in 1907, to help other Korean Americans uh, from the pioneer community uh, spread the word about uh, people's sovereignty, independence, the importance of a nation. And uh, so they developed institutions, they developed uh, uh, commercial activities based on the uh, idea of the new Western world. The Pachapa camp was very unique in a sense. Other Korean community were primarily young single men, whereas the Pachapa camp consists of family members, uh, not only men, women, and children. Therefore, during the peak season, the number could be as high as 100, um, 300. Uh, therefore, Pachapa Camp not only had uh, provided employment services, it has a community, Korea town, which means they had a Korean mission, which affiliated with Calvary Presbyterian Church of Riverside. Uh, church services, they had a wedding ceremony, birthday parties, and discussion groups, and also Korean schools, which provided very important Korean national education to young children. Dosan on Chang Ho, as seen at the left, was famous for his role in the Korean independence movement acting as the Minister of Labor of the Korean provin uh, Provincial Government in Exile. The story of Pachapa Camp was a little-known tale until recently. On March 23, 2017, the city of Riverside designated the site Pachapa Camp as its first point of cultural interest and raised awareness in Korean-American history. During the early 1900s, Koreans living in the United States spent much of their time working for the independence of Korea, which had become a protectorate of Japan in 1905 and was formally colonized in 1910. An Chang-ho, Sing Mon Ri, and other Korean independence activists worked to liberate Korea. Korean women at Pachapa Camp played very important and active roles in the Korean independence movement as well. But the Korean American women specifically at Pachapa Camp, they were extraordinary in the fact that after Pachapa Camp started to dwindle and the men started to look for work elsewhere, they continued to put their efforts into the independence movement. They would hold meetings, they would raise money, they would do all these things that were supposed to be the job of the men. But because the men were looking for work elsewhere, trying to find jobs, the women picked up that role as well, which is an extraordinary feat because they were raising their children, they were fixing things at the camp, they were cooking, cleaning, doing everything, and working as well. In July 1914, World War I broke out. The war would bring with it new technologies, including airplanes. This would later inspire the Korean-American community. By the 1920s, Korean-American activities for the Korean independence movement were in full swing. In fact, Korean-Americans who had moved to Willows in Northern California decided to start their own aviation school. Kim Jong-nim, who was known as a Rice King, 
uh, it became a millionaire by growing rice and uh, when the rice price skyrocketed during World War I, he became uh, very rich. He decided to finance Korean Aviation School at Willows and he met uh, No Beng Min who was appointed as a defense minister of Korean provisional government in Shanghai. So these two men, uh, which is considered as a great encounter, and they talked about establishing aviation school, and uh, they regarded it as a cadet, those who enrolled at the aviation school, not simply a civilian aviation school, but you know, many who decided to volunteer consider themselves as a cadet member fighting for ind national independence. So sometime around between March 1st and March 15, 1920, the school opened at uh, Red, uh, Willows and the school enrolled uh, initially about 23 cadets and later on others uh, joined and be began to grow. However, uh, Kim Jong-nim's rice farm was flooded in early October 1920. And he, although he tried to recover, uh, his farm never uh, was able to reopen and without his financial support, he contributed uh, more than $50,000. That's a huge amount of money at the time. And he, with the money, they were able to lease the land uh, and house, uh, hire an instructor, buy uh, aircraft, and provide room and board for all the cadet members. So this Willows Korean Aviation School, who historically very important not only for Korean American history, but also Korean Air Force in Korea, consider it as a beginning of a Korean Air Force. By the 1930s, major Korean American activities like the founding of the pilot school slowed and shifted toward politics. They were primarily focusing on lobbying activities based in Washington, D.C. The majority of Korean immigrants participated in fundraising efforts. Sung Man Lee, Dosan An Chang Ho, and other Korean American organizations focused on lobbying major superpowers and gaining the independence of Korea. On September 1, 1939, World War II broke out. The United States remained outside of the conflict until after the bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. Korean Americans enlisted in the U.S. Navy, Army, and Air Force. John Park enlisted in the Army and was killed during the Normandy landing. Fred O. Oh enlisted in the Air Force and flew more than 100 times during World War II. Three of Dosan's children also enlisted in the U.S. military. Philip Ahn, Dosan's oldest son, enlisted in the U.S. Army. Susan Ahn, Dosan's eldest daughter, enlisted in the Navy and became the first Asian American woman gunnery officer. Dosan's youngest son, Ralph, also enlisted and served in the U.S. Navy with his older sister. Going back to uh, the beginning of World War II, uh, you know, all of us Koreans in the community were excited. Of course, war is terrible, but this would be the chance for Korea's independence, of course. So practically every able-bodied fellow was in the service. The most famous of Korean-American military war heroes who served during World War II was Colonel Young Oak Kim. Young Oak Kim is known for being one of the greatest soldier in American history. He is most famous for his accomplishment as a, someone who went through a uh, so-called battle in Anjou. There was a no man's land between the German uh, defense line and the Allied forces trying to launch a ma major attack. And anything moves, the, either Germans and the Allied forces will shoot at each other. So they were afraid to launch an attack. But Young Kim volunteered. He crossed into the landmines and captured two German prisoners of the war and brought them back to the Allied forces. And based on their interrogation answers, Allied forces were able to launch an attack and liberate them. So that is one of the greatest stories, actually, about it. 
Young Oak's wife was also in the U.S. military as an army nurse. They were the first Korean-American couple to serve as Allied officers against Nazi Germany during World War II. We got married while I was a private in the, or a corporal in the, in the armed forces. I hardly ever saw my wife. Uh, and uh, even after I got commissioned and all that, I hardly saw her. Uh, now, she was a nurse, and uh, shortly after uh, I went overseas, she volunteered for the nursing corps, was accepted by the U.S. Army. Did you join the Army to become an Army nurse? You did back in... Yes. What, what year was that? <laughs> when was the war? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> 19... The, so during the outbreak of the war, the yeah. World War II, okay. World War II ended in 1945 with the surrender of Germany and Japan. After 35 years of occupation, Korea was finally free from Japanese rule. In June 1950, just five years after the end of World War II, the Korean War broke out. The Korean Peninsula is the only place that is surrounded by four major superpowers who always wanted some of Korea. During the early 1940s, there was no exception. China wanted a piece of the pie. Russia wanted some action. Japan already had colonized Korea. And the United States was trying to use the Korean Peninsula as the last line to check uh, the spread of communism. Recently, the Army authorized another battle star for the Korean War. The Korean War was inevitable. At the time, most Koreans had two aspirations. Number one, unify Korea. Nobody wanted a divided Korea. Number two, they wanted pearls pro-Japanese collaborators, which in South Korea, they failed to do so. But in North Korea, with communist ideologies, they purged pro-Japanese collaborators. So both sides were racing towards a collision course. There were a lot of clashes along the 38th parallel before the outbreak of the Korean War. South Korean and North Korean troops were firing at each other. It was like uh, almost like a daily routine until finally North Korea, they decided to attack South Korea uh, in June 1950. The Korean War had tremendous casualties on both sides and it was a true tragedy. The Korean War halted with an armistice agreement on July 27, 1953, putting a ceasefire on the violence and death. The Korean Peninsula would remain split at the 38th parallel, and the area, known as the Demilitarized Zone, became the most heavily guarded border in the world. Today, North and South Korea are technically still at war. A peace treaty was never signed. Korea is the only country still divided against its own will. Another amazing Korean-American who served his country with honor was Dr. Sammy Lee. Born in Fresno, California, Dr. Lee was an Olympic diver. While earning his medical degree at USC, he trained and competed in diving, winning gold at the 1948 and 1952 Olympic Games. The men's high dive finds the great Sammy Lee, U.S. Army Major, defending his title won in 1948. Oh, uh, during the 1932 Olympics in Los Angeles, uh, I was at the public pool in, in uh, Rarasaco, and a black uh, American uh, uh, fellow, Hart Crumb, he uh, was coaching me in diving, and uh, I, I did my first uh, somersault, and now, and I told my dad, "Papa, someday I want to be an uh, Olympic diving champion." He said, "Son, I'll back you a hundred percent if you promise me 
they'll become a doctor of medicine too. <laughs> so uh, I, I promised him that uh, I would be a doctor of medicine. So you kept the, both promises? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Registering the highest total awarded to any single dive in the competition. And Sammy Lee, whose parents were born in Korea, becomes the first two-time winner in Olympic diving history. Sammy gets a kiss from fellow American Pat McCormick. Then joins his wife, who had confidently set sail for Helsinki even before Sammy had technically qualified in the American Olympic trials. Sammy Lee of Los Angeles, Occidental College, and the U.S. Army Medical Corps is more than a medal winner for the United States. He is a living testament before the peoples of the world to equality of opportunity in America. Dr. Lee's life and accomplishments include receiving the Amateur Athletic Union's James E. Sullivan Award and coaching Olympic divers Bob Webster and Greg Luganis. Dr. Lee practiced medicine until the 1970s. He was also lifelong friends with Colonel Young Oak Kim. After the Korean War, Korean Americans faded from the limelight. However, in 1962, Alfred H. Song became the first Asian American to serve on the California State Assembly. Alfred Song uh, was a second generation uh, Korean American, uh, and uh, he uh, was born in Hawaii. However, a family relocated to California, Southern California. And later on, he was elected as a uh, state legislature and uh, later on became the first Asian American elected of, uh, officer in California and later on state senator. So, you know, we are proud to honor him as the first Asian American elected officials in California. Song paved the way for the future of Asian and Korean Americans. In fact, the Korean American population would increase dramatically from 1960 to 2000. If you trace the source, who started this chain migration, it could be as high as 40% of all Korean immigrants who came after 1970s. The, it was started by Korean women who married American servicemen. These GI brides were pretty much the main reason or main um, ability that Koreans could come to the United States because they would sponsor their brothers, their sisters, their mothers, their cousins, um, family members basically to come to the United States because in 1965 the Immigration um, Act was passed and that allowed family members to sponsor their other family members in Korea and other nations and whatnot to come to the United States. And so GI brides who had come to the United States after the Korean War were the reason that other Korean immigrants were able to come to the United States. The Korean immigrant community struggled to adjust during the late 1960s to 1980s because of discrimination and racism. At the same time, the Jewish American business owners left inner cities because of the race riots of the 1960s, like the Watts Uprising. The exodus of Jewish American shop owners provided an opening for Korean Americans who purchased those inner city stores. Yeah, Korean immigrants who came during 1970s and 1980s were known as uh, new urban immigrants. Uh, unlike traditional uh, migrants, immigrants who come from poverty-stricken, low-income, you know, farming background, these Korean immigrants were highly educated, urban background, a managerial background, or skilled middle-class background. And therefore, you know, when you talk about uh, the readiness in terms of their skill transfer, they not only educated, urban, middle class background, so they were willing to work hard and they thought they could achieve American dreams very quickly. One of the ways Korean Americans coped with their situation was attending church. In fact, Korean Americans are unique for their church centered lifestyles. Almost 70% of the Korean American population attends church, even to this day. When Korean immigrants arrived in the United States, they were unaware of the civil rights movement, the race riots of the 1960s, or the racial history of their new home. Korean Americans struggled to adjust because of racism, 
language barriers, and cultural differences. An example of a Korean American who struggled to survive was Chol Soo Lee, who was wrongly imprisoned for a murder he didn't commit in 1973. And he's perhaps most famous for uh, Chol Soo Lee case. Uh, Chol Soo Lee was the Korean American immigrant uh, youth uh, who got into trouble uh, and accused of uh, murdering China, Chinatown gang member. And he was convicted and later on sentenced to death sentence by, because of his investigative journalism report. Uh, Chol Soo Lee was later released. So when I think of Chol Soo Lee, I think of so many children of an immigrant from south of border and from China, Vietnam, Hmong, do you know, just almost killing each other in American killing fields, it's an American rite of passage. And those of you who are lucky enough to be here, you are lucky to me. Because always, it is only 10% of the ch children of immigrants go to universities. And so many of them die before they even meet their girlfriend. I met them, so many of them in my class. That's all this hypocrisy. Korean immigrant merchants continued to struggle in the 1970s. By this period, they had become the middleman minority. This meant that they served as the buffer between the dominant white and subordinate black populations. The anger and frustrations of the African-American community was directed toward Korean merchants who represented economic disenfranchisement. Racial tensions increased and boycotts and violence deepened the divide. K.W. Lee reported on this so-called Black Korean conflict, and in 1979, he published the Koreatown Weekly in an effort to give voice to his community and bridge the cultural gap. But the racial issues, coupled with police brutality and government neglect, worsened. By the 1980s, the Black Korean conflict would grab headlines. On March 3, 1991, the police beating of African-American Rodney King was caught on tape. This was one of the first times an incident like this would be filmed. Media played the footage over and over again. The enraged African-American community demanded justice. The four officers involved in the beating would be sent to trial. Thirteen days later, March 16, 1991, yeah. Korean store owner Sun Jia Du uh, shot and killed 16 year old African American girl known as uh, Latasha Hollins. And this incident was also captured by a security camera. And media got hold of this tape and they only showed the last moment when she was pulling trigger and Hollins. Uh, falling down without uh, uh, contextualizing it, without showing what occurred prior to. So these images of Rodney King beating and Latasha Harlan's shooting became sensational in Los Angeles TV market. And between March 1991 and April 1992, when the riot uh, broke out. TV stations in Los Angeles constantly, almost every day, showed those two images. The Korean American and African American communities attempted to form the Black Korean Alliance. But efforts to bring peace and calm between the two minorities would fail. In November 1991, Soon Ja Du was sentenced for the shooting of Latasha Harlins. Du received a fine suspended jail time and community service. This further outraged the African-American community because justice had not been served. Just a few months later, on April 29, 1992, the four police officers involved in the Rodney King beating were found not guilty. The verdicts would spark the Los Angeles riots the same day. In one such scene, at the corner of Florence and Normandy in South Central Los Angeles, would become symbolic of the riots. They don't represent the people no more. Hey, 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 hey.
the violence spread like cancer cells to other cities such as San Francisco, Seattle, Atlanta, Minneapolis, and Chicago. The madness and mayhem in other places did not compare to the scenes in L.A. During the violence, Korean-American businesses were targeted by looters and rioters. The unrest decimated the Korean-American community, whose businesses and dreams went up in smoke. Korean-Americans were left to fend for themselves. The Los Angeles Police Department abandoned Koreatown, and media would unfairly portray Korean-Americans as gun-toting vigilantes during the riots. During the six-day incident, more than 50 people died. Rioters caused around $1 billion in damages. The Korean-American community suffered disproportionately, incurring 400 million of the total losses. More than 2,200 Korean-owned businesses were damaged, looted, or destroyed. One Korean-American, Eddie Lee, died during the civil unrest. The April 29, 1992 LA riots marked a turning point for the Korean-American community, whose identity was born or reborn that day. The wake-up call was a watershed moment for Korean-Americans who realized they had to participate in politics, give back to the community, and bridge cultural gaps through coalition building. Okay, LA City imposed all kind of uh, restrictions to the victim liquor stores and grocery stores. Instead of helping them out, they further limited their function so they could not recover. Korean Americans spent the next decade raising their voices. Today, the Korean American community has significantly more representation in local, state, and federal politics than it did prior to the LA riots. Senator John Lim of Oregon was elected in 1992. Jay Kim became the first Korean American to serve in the United States Congress in 1993. Suki Kang became the mayor of Irvine in 2008. Young Kim was elected to the California State Assembly in 2014. And in 2015, David Ryu was the first Korean American elected to the Los Angeles City Council. The popularity of Korean culture hit mainstream America hard around the early 2000s. Suddenly, Koreatown became a hip place to eat as interest in Korean food was spurred by trending K-drama and K-pop. Korean actors like Steven Yeun and Sandra Oh also heightened interest in Korean culture. This Hallyu wave helped bridge cultural gaps and Korean Americans became more visible and accepted. Uh, so far, the images of Korean wave is relatively positive and that actually inculcated uh, the general U.S. population's interest in, I mean, not everybody, but to a large extent, uh, their interest in Korean pop culture. I mean, they are now began to wonder like what K-pop is, even if they don't listen to any K-pop, right? Uh, they probably can uh, think of uh, Gangnam Style when they were asked whether they know any Korean music. Or maybe you know they would watch Korean films on Netflix or some other uh, you know venues. So uh, as their interest grows, and probably they are likely to gain some positive impression on Korea and Korean culture, which in turn would likely to uh, exert some uh, positive influence on their perception of Korean Americans, or at least they would trigger some interest in Korean Americans. They would finally recognize there are a sizable number of Korean Americans in this country, uh, and uh, they have a lot to contribute, so and so forth. So uh, I think uh, it's very likely. Today, Korean Americans are better organized, working with other groups to connect and understand each other's communities. In 2010, a group of Korean American leaders formed the Council of Korean Americans. The CKA works to raise the voice and identity of Korean Americans on a national scale. Korean American students excel in school and professional fields. The success and visibility of Korean Americans has increased dramatically since the days of the 1992 LA riots. However, this small community of almost two million still faces many challenges. Undocumented workers and students are subject to deportation and poverty. The working Korean immigrant class continues to struggle to make ends meet. Meanwhile, the older Korean American generation, senior citizens, also struggle to survive. Uh, we are having uh, a growing number of third generation Korean Americans who are the descendants of the post-1965 immigrants. And we haven't really talked much about 
that generation. We have talked about 1.5 generation a lot and second generation to some extent, but we haven't really discussed much about the third generation Korean Americans. Uh, and obviously they have different sense of identity, different sense of uh, affiliation with their roots and so forth. So I think uh, it's time to, to begin to talk about them. You know, history is a source of your identity. If you do not know your own history, uh, you really don't know who you are, and you are on a shaky ground. And the first step toward knowing who you are begins with understanding where you came from, where your parents came from, what they struggled with, and you, your roots. And the Korean American history, therefore, is foundation of creating Korean American identity. Also, the Korean American population has uh, growing even more diverse because now we have influx of uh, uh, different Korean diaspora populations, including Korean Chinese, Korean defectors, uh, so and so forth. And uh, there have been some kinds of hierarchy or divides between the Korean Americans and the new types of Korean dias diaspora immigrants. So we need to discuss that. And also we need to discuss how to embrace different um, groups of Korean Americans, not only the full-fledged, uh, full-blooded Korean uh, Americans, but the, uh, the multiracial and multi-ethnic Korean Americans who are growing in number, as well as Korean adoptees, so and so forth. The future of Korean America depends on how we build our identity and community consciousness, understand our history, and how we communicate with our diverse fellow Americans.